Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Constitution Center. I'm Lana Ulrich, in-house counsel here at the center. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to ask you to please join me in a moment of silence for the 11 people who lost their lives this past weekend during the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. Thank you. This past week, the NCC actually co-sponsored the first national First Amendment conference at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. So I, Jeff Rosen, and some of my NCC colleagues were actually just there a few days ago. And so our thoughts are with everyone in the Pittsburgh community and all of the families um, at this time. Um, before we get to today's program, I have a few announcements about some exciting programs that are coming up here at the center. Um, in the next few months, we have Ken Starr, who will be here, I think next week, discussing his definitive account of the Clinton investigation, uh, a panel discussion on Hamilton, the man, the musical, and the law, which coincides with our feature exhibit, Hamilton, the constitutional clashes that shaped a nation. And if you hadn't had the chance to check it out, I recommend that you do. It's downstairs right in the Annenberg lobby. And finally, we are adding a new program to our calendar next month, November 28th which is the symposium that we are presenting in partnership with The Atlantic Magazine to discuss what the founders would say about the media, courts, and Congress today. So you can visit constitutioncenter.org slash debate for more information um, on how to register for this program. And it's now with great pleasure that I introduce today's guests and today's program. Um, to my left is Professor Aziz Hook. He is the Frank and Bernice J. Greenberg Professor of Law and Mark Claster Mamelin Teaching Scholar at the University of Chicago. Before joining the law school faculty, he worked as Associate Counsel, Counsel and then Director of the Liberty and National Security Project of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, where he litigated cases in the Courts of Appeals and in the Supreme Court. He also served as, consenior, as senior consultant analyst for the International Crisis Group, where he researched constitutional design in Pakistan, Nepal, Afghanistan, and Sri Lanka. And he clerked for Judge Robert Sack of the Second Circuit and for Justice Ginsburg of the Supreme Court. Tom Ginsburg is the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law, Ludwig and Hild Wolf Research Scholar, and Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. He currently co-directs the Comparative Constitutions Project, an effort funded by the National Science Foundation to gather and analyze the constitutions of all independent nation states since 1789. And the NCC worked with Professor Ginsburg um, as part of the Constitutions Project on this online tool called Constitute, where you can read, search, and compare all of the world's constitutions. You can go to constituteproject.org and check out this great tool. Um, before teaching, Professor Ginsburg served as legal advisor at the Iran US Claims Tribunal, and he continues to work with numerous international agencies and foreign governments on legal and constitutional reform. Please join me in welcoming Aziz and Tom Ginsburg. Thank you. So, Aziz and Tom, thank you for being here. I think this is a critical time to be having this discussion, and there's a lot to talk about. Um, Aziz, could you start us off by just discussing a little bit about the genesis of this book? Uh, you both wrote a law review article not too long ago called How to Lose a Constitutional Democracy, and now we have this book called How to Save a Constitutional Democracy. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about what prompted you to write the initial article, then the book, and, and why the change in title? Is there any difference in the two? Um, just can you briefly speak about that? In late 2016, both of us noticed commonalities between uh, kinds of political rhetoric and uh, claims about how political power would be used in the United States and things that were happening in other countries where democracy was seemingly in the decline. And that prompted us to ask whether there was a, uh, first of all, a, a, a global trend in the decline of democracies, and second, whether the United States, given its constitution, was at risk of that uh, trend. Uh, and and our, our first effort in that regard was a, a law review article, uh, which 
tried to identify the ways in which other countries' democracies were failing, right? kind of a, a, a typology or a diagnosis of democratic failure around the world, uh, and uh, some effort to, to think about whether the US was vulnerable to those failures. And then what we did in our book was to take that diagnosis and try and build a set of remedies or proposed uh, uh, protections for democracy, uh, not just for the United States, but also for new uh, countries uh, designing new constitutions around the world. So the, the book is really an effort to step beyond the uh, arm flapping that has preoccupied much of the popular media since 2016 about the fate of democracy uh, and to try and say something constructive about where we could go forward. Mm -hmm. Great. So Tom, if you want to add anything to Aziz's uh, account of how the book came about and then also if you wouldn't mind jumping in and just defining for us some key terms and we can start with maybe defining what exactly is a liberal constitutional democracy so we know what we're talking about. Right, so um, maybe I'll start with that. Uh, democracy is sometimes called an essentially contested concept. There's almost as many definitions as analysts. Uh, and yet we think there is a kind of core to it. Uh, and so we have our distinctive definition. So if you talk to political scientists, they focus almost exclusively on one institution, which is elections in which the loser gives up power or give, uh, concedes defeat. And of course, that's absolutely essential to any functioning democracy. But we add two other components. Uh, and I guess maybe the, the insight here is that democracy and elections are legally constructed. You can't really have elections unless you have room to, uh, uh, um, for open debate, freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom to run for office. So there's a small number of rights that we think really go to any plausible definition of democracy. Um, the other thing that we emphasize is what we call the bureaucratic rule of law. At the most basic level, you can't imagine having an election in which the vote counters are partisan. Uh, and so that's absolutely critical. They have to be following rules that are laid out in advance for the process. Uh, but more broadly, we think the idea of a meritocratic civil service in some sense uh, that, that administers the law faithfully, and we know it's an ideal and maybe never actually achieved. Nevertheless, it's really important. And one way to illustrate that is um, imagine if an incoming president here in the United States could hire and fire two million people. Well, that would, in some sense, raise the stakes of elections to be so high that no one would ever want to give up power. There's something about the permanence of a bureaucracy acting according to the rule of law, which actually allows policy change and contestation on the top. Um, and so we think all of those are really critical elements. And that's a, a, a a thicker definition than some would have, but it still allows a lot of room for policy change. It's compatible with a social democracy, it's compatible with a libertarian political economy, a lot of room for the people collectively to, to figure out what kind of policies they want. And uh, yeah, so I, maybe that's, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so Aziz, how does that fit in with what we have here in the United States, which is this representative republic where we don't necessarily, we have democracy, but it's not direct democracy. We filter our choices through our representatives. How does that fit in with your definition and with how you can evaluate the health of a democracy? Uh, as Tom said, there are many different ways of transforming public opinion into uh, legislated or governmental policies. And in the United States, uh, the framers of the Constitution were working and writing at a time at which the word democracy, at least if it didn't have a modifier in front of it, had something of a bad odor. Uh, it was associated with uh, mob rule of various sorts. And they had a number of different examples of institutional mechanisms through which popular preferences could be translated into uh, outcomes uh, 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 backed by the government. Uh, for example, in the Greek, ancient Greek contest, there were a variety of, uh, of lot or random selection-based me mechanisms that they might have, have looked to. And we know that Madison actually uh, read a bunch of, 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 uh, of texts about uh, ancient Greek constitutions. Uh, and they picked an indirect form of democracy. Um, it is nonetheless a form of government in which first, the average person on the street, the average citizen on the street can exercise some kind of meaningful participation 
in the process of selecting leaders, right? So uh, I'm sure that everyone here uh, who is lawfully allowed to is, is, is thinking about, maybe has voted in the midterm elections. Uh, many people are maybe not in Philadelphia, but in, certainly in Pennsylvania, live in contested seats, right? The fact that there are many, uh, the fact that first of all, people can participate, and the fact that many of the outcomes, not, maybe not all of them, but many of the outcomes in democratic contests are uncertain beforehand, are ex ante un, in, unpredictable, as the uh, political scientists say, means under our definition that we have a, a recognizable democratic system, notwithstanding the choice to use indirect rather than direct representation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we have some key terms to find. Um, so Tom, uh, just to set the table a little bit more, are there any historical examples that you discuss in the book uh, that you'd like to mention that provide a kind of a good illustration of what can happen when a democracy either starts to decline or maybe there's some erosion going on. Right, so a first basic point is that we distinguish from uh, the way that constitutions sort of die historically and the way they are dying in our current moment. And I should just say that the political scientists who study this think the number of democracies peaked around the world in about 2006. And every year since then, there have been fewer democracies. There's been an erosion in the quality of democracy, even in the advanced industrial countries. I note that the Economist Intelligence Unit last year uh, downgraded the United States from being a full democracy to a flawed democracy, uh, largely by virtue of our, the way we run elections. Um, so, um, but you know, in our field of comparative constitutional law, the, the thing that the people have in mind most of the time when they think of democracy ending is um, something quite different, a very fast, sudden collapse of democracy, the military coup, the communist revolution. Um, that doesn't really happen anymore. Instead, what we observe around the world in our current century is the erosion of democracy by death by a thousand cuts, or we use the analogy of the boiling frog, where it's one small step at a time, each of which, each step of which might itself seem okay. Um, might itself seem yeah, compatible with some core ideas of democracy. But when you have enough such small steps on enough of the dimensions of democracy, soon you can find yourself in an eroded situation. And uh, so we talk a lot about Venezuela, with, where democracy is now over, clearly, but that took 20-something years. Hungary, uh, where democracy is pretty much over, um, and that took less than that, it took seven years. Um, and uh, Poland, Turkey, there's a lot of contemporary cases that we talk about with the idea that we do have something to learn. So one of our core constructs is, you know, as Americans, we're so comfortable thinking ourselves, of ourselves as being exceptional and our constitution as being exceptional, we're not so sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Aziz, is there any, you know, are there any other particular examples that you might want to talk about and then maybe get us started talking about the state of democracy here in the United States? Um, you know, many polls um, seem to indicate that faith in our own institutions is kind of at an all-time low, with the exception of the military, um, which is ironic because the founders feared a standing army. Um, so if there are any other examples, and then maybe turn to the United States and kind of evaluate what the state of our democracy now, as Tom mentioned, it seems like our score is going down, so. <laughs> well, let me, let me give a couple of examples from uh, places where democracy has eroded, where, where you've seen this slow process of uh, democratic backsliding rather than the fast collapse of democracy that I think is the stereotypical view of how democracies end, right? This is the, the view that, have, that most people have is based upon their understanding of the end of the Weimar Republic and the beginning of Nazi rule, right? And things don't really happen that way anymore. And we, we can talk a little bit about why perhaps the uh, the military in particular is not, is, is unlikely to, to have a catalytic role uh, in that regard. If we, if we look at places like Hungary and Poland, uh, one of the key moves that has uh, 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 precipitated the decline in quality of democracy is changes to what in the United States we call the checks and balances, right? Uh, in, in other countries, uh, the checks and balances, though, are different in two regards. The first regard is most other constitutions around the world do not just depend upon the existence of three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judiciary, as a means of checking governmental power. 
They use a variety of other independent checking institutions, things like human rights ombudsmen, things like independent media boards, things like uh, public protectors or public prosecutors who are tasked with exercising government power independently and ensuring that others who are elected to government power don't abuse those authorities. A, an early move across backsliding democracies is an attack on those independent guarantees of democracy under the rule of law. Equally, an early move in many, democr in many backsliding democracies is an attack upon the courts as a check upon the accumulation of power by a single leader. Hungary and Poland provide nice examples of this, but in different ways. In Hungary, a party called Fidesz obtained a legislative majority in 2010. That legislative majority didn't entitle Fidesz to amend the constitution. The Constitution had a, a four-fifth amendment rule, right? It's very difficult to amend, much in the way that our Constitution is difficult to amend. But, Fidesz realized, nobody had written down that the four-fifth amendment rule was itself subject to amendment only with a four-fifth majority. So they used their legislative majority to change the amendment rule and then rewrote the Constitution to gut all of the independent bodies that ensured against the abuse of power. So they captured the media board, they stocked the analog to our Federal Reserve with Fidesz loyalists, uh, the independent prosecutor body that was meant to prevent corruption within the government was wholly placed under Fidesz's thumb. Right? So the, and, and we see something like this erosion of independent checks in other places around the world. We also see attacks on the courts. So Fidesz uh, restock the courts. They use the power of constitutional amendment to restructure the courts. Uh, they, enact, they amended the new constitution they, they enacted, it was the, their fourth amendment, uh, to wipe the slate clean of all jurisprudence that preceded Fidesz rule. Right? So they just, they just wipe, the, wipe the slate clean. In Poland, where you had a similar process of democratic backsliding, uh, the majority party there, the PIS, did not obtain the necessary democratic uh, power, the necessary legislative uh, quorum to change the constitution. But they found a slate of non-constitutional statutory changes that allow them to achieve much the same thing. So for example, uh, with respect to the judiciary, there's been a long and contested fight over the composition of the Polish judiciary. One of the most important moves in that regard was the decision by the PIS to lower the retirement age within the judiciary. And that single move, I think it was from 72 to uh, 68, uh, stripped the judiciary of about uh, a, a fifth of its personnel, right? So they, with one blow, created a whole slate of open seats and then they fill the seats with their loyalists. One question to ask in the United States, and let me, I'll pose it as a question rather than as a, as a full on answer. One question to ask is whether the erosion of independent checking institutions, right, not just at the level of the branch, this is one of the really important lessons that you see from around the world. You can't just rely upon the fact of three branches, right? It's too little institutional variety if you really want checks and balances, if you really want constrained government, right? In the United States, what prevents the erosion of those, uh, the, the analogs to those independent checking institutions? And, and second, what would a lawful form of judicial capture by an incumbent party look like, right? This is what you see in, in instances like Poland, where measures within the technical terms of the law are employed to bring the judiciary into close alignment with one particular partisan formation, right? And, and I think those are the productive questions that one can start to ask by looking at how democratic failure arises in other countries. Mm -hmm.
Tom, do you have any answers? <laughs> uh, any questions? answers, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I'm sort of thinking, well, how, how does that apply to the United States, which you may mm -hmm. be able, uh, wanting to ask about later. But just thinking about the courts, you know, there's a lot of discussion now on the Democratic side about what should we do? Should, we, uh, should they try to propose packing the courts and expanding them? And this gets, I'm jumping a little bit ahead to our solutions. We're fundamentally Madisonians. We think that, uh, you know, that checks are important, real checks. We think that super majorities are important. We think that trying to shift politics away from the polls and back to the center is a good thing. And there's institutions that can do this. Um, you know, so one simple idea in this regard would be to restore the, um, the filibuster in the Senate and maybe to, um, exp this is my idea, I don't know if Aziz agrees with it, but to expand the federal courts in a bipartisan way where you have the majority leader and the minority leader of the Judiciary Committee coming together to agree on a package of judges. The fact is the federal courts in our country are understaffed and underfunded uh, and actually do need attention in order to fulfill their constitutional role. Uh, but they won't be able to do that if it's just a partisan football over which we fight elections. We have to get, elect get the judiciary out of um, being an issue in elections. We're not there, obviously, this cycle. Um, but that might be something down the road to restore super majorities to, let, to judicial appointments. Mm -hmm. We've got a bunch of ideas like that. Yeah. Well, Aziz, you posed these great questions. Do you have thoughts on some of the preliminary solutions Tom has brought up? Sure. Let, let me say something about the independent checking institutions mm -hmm. uh, other than the judiciary, uh, because I think that's something that ha has been in the news, and I think we do, we do genuinely learn something from um, other countries. Uh, so South Africa is a constitution um, uh, enacted in 1996 after the end of apartheid that in one chapter, chapter nine of the constitution, sets out a slate of independent institutions that are meant to prevent the abuse of authority. Uh, the most interesting and important of those is something called the public protector. And uh, uh, the, the public protector has been really important in the last... Uh, decade in fighting back against the systematic capture of the South African state by a very narrow, uh, uh, corrupt, uh, 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 small group of financial interest. Right? So the basic story is that President Zuma, President Jacob Zuma, uh, forged a relationship with one particular business family. This business family exercised inordinate control over how uh, state-owned enterprises, right? South African state owns a bunch of enterprises like oil production, uh, uh, worked. Basically, any major cabinet decision had to be signed off by this family, the Gupta family. This comes to light only because of the actions of the public protector. The public protector writes a report about Zuma's misuse of, of uh, federal funds, for, national funds, excuse me, for his private residence. Uh, President Zuma says, well, that's nice. Uh, you say I have to pay this back. I'll take that recommendation under advisement and get back to you. <laughs> the public protector goes to the constitutional court. Nice interaction here between the, the, the court and these independent bodies. And the court says, no, you, Zuma, and the parliament have to take these remedies seriously. And it's because the public protector is empowered by the court that, that she is able to turn around and write a report called the State of Capture Report that damningly documents Zuma's financial corruption and that leads to uh, losses of the ANC in local elections and Zuma being ousted as a, uh, as a leader, right? So the operation of these, inst of these independent institutions is, is, is pivotal in the South African context to the prevention of serious financial corruption at the highest level of government. Now, what do we have in the United States that serves the same end, right? So uh, Lana mentioned that Ken Starr is coming uh, to, the, to the NCC. Mm -hmm. Ken Starr used to be uh, a figure called the Independent Council. Under a statute called the Ethics and Government Act, there used to be a mechanism for freestanding investigations of uh, corruption, misuse of authority, uh, by high-level government officials. That statute came under a lot of criticism in the wake of the Whitewater and other investigations, and now no longer exists. 
right? Now we have a set of what's called special counsel regulations, which are, which create a kind of independent investigator, but one who is not protected by a constitutional rule, not protected by a statute, but protected by a federal regulation, right? That's a very, just looking across the world, that is a, a uniquely or, or, or very rare form of weak protection for independent prosecutors tasked with rooting out corruption in the government. Worse, worse from the perspective of, global, of democratic backsliding, in the last decade and a half on the Supreme Court, on both the left and the right, this is not a criticism of one side or other of the court, there is a notion that has developed that democracy is served, is best served and only served by a presidency that has a unitary character. And one must be careful about how one uses the term unitary. The way that it's used in this context is the president has exclusive and complete control over all his or her subordinates. And a corollary of the, of the unitary presidency theory is that it is not feasible, it is not uh, constitutionally licit to have bodies of the kind that we have, where we see all around the world operating successfully as in South Africa as mechanisms of, for preventing governmental corruption, right? So whatever the justifications are for the unitary presidency theory, and there are, there are good arguments in its favor, a strike against it is that in its operation and in its likely operation in the near term, it is uh, conducive to uh, a weaker form of the rule of law, in particular when it comes to that element of the rule of law that is necessary for democracy, right? So here's, here's one implication for the United States, right? There are certain kinds of constitutional doctrines that have developed outside of the context of democratic backsliding, that when we move into an era in which uh, certain kinds of democratic backsliding may be uh, feasible, that doctrine becomes pathological or it becomes dangerous. Yeah, may I just follow up? So yeah. one of the big themes here is that uh, democracy, of course, is governed by the people, elections are very central, but when it's really under stress, it is sometimes uh, institutions which do not have a democratic legitimacy or are not democratically elected, certainly, that end up saving democracy. Uh, institutions like the courts, the bureaucrats who count the ballots, inspectors general uh, in every federal agency. We have these. They're not very well protected right now. It's really a norm that protects them from being fired for political purposes. Um, uh, militaries who refuse to go along when a president says no, I, when, a, when a losing incumbent says no, I'm not leaving office. So there's something in general about, and it's, it's somewhat ironic, and I suppose, but that, uh, that one needs institutions which are loyal to the rule of law uh, in order to actually protect democracy from its own participants. May, may I briefly go back to your early question about um, the Republican quality of the US Constitution? Mm -hmm. sure. Lana uh, early on asked or, or pointed out that the, that the US Constitution is written as a republic. It's not written as a, as, a, as a pure democracy. And one of the qualities of uh, republican to, uh, uh, government that the framers emphasized was the fact that the mechanisms of national government would select for individual leaders who had quintessential republican virtues. Right? And, and, and small r Republican virtues meant that you were public regarding. You cared about the res publica, the thing that is the public, right? the, the, the common good. And the mechanisms that they thought would do that are first, the, the process of, of filtration and selection of individual candidates from the local to the national. Right? This is described for those of you who've, who've read it in Federalist 10. Right? And the assumption was that there would be a group of, of, of national level politicians, and they, they very much had Washington in mind, who were particularly virtuous and who would be selected naturally through the process of filtration that, uh, uh, that, that generated the House and the Senate. And the same was true for the federal courts. In Federalist uh, 78, 
uh, Hamilton says, look, we don't need to worry about politicized selection of the federal judiciary because the pool of people who are eligible for a position on the federal courts, eligible by dint of being men educated in the law sufficiently that they would be credible appointees, is so small, there are so few people, right? This is where I make a joke about Georgetown Prep. Um, <laughs> that's so small that, that we're not gonna have strategic selection, right? So, so the framers had in mind a social theory of elites that was a foundation for their Republican form of government. And one way of understanding what we're, we're pointing out is, I, I, I don't think we share, we as a, as, a, as a country, share the idea that there are elites who are especially public-minded and therefore worthy of trust. I, I, if anything, I think the, the, the common intuition today is quite the inverse. And our, one of our points is, look, if you look around the world, at, at what protects democracy when it comes under moments of stress. It turns out to be these non-democratic institutions that are in some fashion insulated from the currents of immediate partisan contestation, like under appropriate circumstances, courts, independent election bodies, and even in one case that we talk about, the military. That's really interesting. So, so Tom, um, kind of jumping off of what Aziz said with this sort of distrust of elites and then something that you said, bureaucracy is a check. I want to ask you about this New York Times anonymous op-ed that came out that was published by someone who was uh, supposedly a senior uh, person in the Trump administration who was kind of suggesting that where they agreed or, you know, with President Trump's um, policies, they would sort of go along, but there, there were some cases where they seemed to almost be subverting that for whatever reason, if it was adherence to the Constitution or their own policy preferences. Some people think that maybe that's a good thing that we have these, you know, career civil servants who are in agencies that are kind of acting independently of whoever's the president, but others thought, you know, maybe this is something to be worried about. Are we having, having a risk of a kind of a deep state coup versus a military coup? I'm just interested in your thoughts on that, and how do you view bureaucracy as a check today? Great, and we, uh, I'm not sure we've not talked about this, so we might disagree, but um, uh, from my point of view, that was rather extraordinary. We don't know that it was actually a civil servant uh, it seemed like it was a political appointee. Uh, either way, I think it's uh, you know extraordinary and not uh, something that we should be celebrating uh, because whatever the momentary benefit, if you're on that side of the political aisle, um, there's obviously no accountability whatsoever for the person who makes the decision uh, to pull the piece of paper off the president's desk. No one elected that person, um, and um, uh, this was. And, and, and so, uh, so I think it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, what does that do for the deep state? Well, look, there, the, the deep state is a, it's an odd term. No, it's, it, I think it goes back to the Ottomans, actually, is where it originally developed. Anytime you have a bureaucracy uh, along the lines that we think is good, is important in order to achieve the ends that democracy sets out, you're going to need agents. You need people to build walls. You need people to process forms, whatever your position is. There's always going to be a tension. And that's just inherent in the structure of government. So I don't uh, use the deep state idea. Um, and I don't think we've seen it, although that particular incident I've found very disturbing. And um, if it was an unelected civil servant, maybe even worse than if it was a political appointee. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Aziz, what are your thoughts? I I would put that incident in light or in the context of a broader pattern. And it's a broader pattern of uh, back and forth between the White House and in the president in particular and the larger federal bureaucracy. And it's a pattern in which presidents don't always get what they want and there is often considerable pushback uh, from the bureaucracy. So for example, um, I've uh, written about the uh, decision of President Obama to close Guantanamo. Right? He declares this very early on uh, after he uh, successfully ran for office in 2006 and fails. Uh, indeed, if you look at the, 
look at the data, uh, the rate at which people are released from Guantanamo dramatically slows down under Obama in comparison to Bush, right? And a large part of that is resistance from the military bureaucracy, right? The military bureaucracy has preferences over uh, the rate at which people should be released. And you can disagree or agree with the, with the preferences, and that doesn't matter. Uh, the point, but the point is, is that they had a, a, a tool, and, and, and actually a, a several tools, through which to hinder presidential policy making. This turns out to happen all the time. Right? It turns out to happen all the time across what we call our administrative state, the, the panoply of entities that uh, uh, agencies, departments, bureaus that actually produce policy. Right? And, and indeed, one of our colleagues at the University of Chicago has written about how run-of-the-mill administrative agencies will find ways to duck presidential scrutiny by recharacterizing the policies they want to follow, especially when those policies don't jibe with what the president wants, so that those policies don't have to go through the White House, or they, can, they, they break up policies that would, are so big they would have to go to the White House into two policies and, and, and slightly stagger them. And so they engage in these kind of strategic uh, 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 roundabouts of, of, of the presidency. So the idea that, that a presidency can be operating in tension with, rather than in tandem with, the larger government, I actually think is not uncommon. Right? I, think, I think that happens all the time to a degree that people don't realize. And, and, and it might be that this example, as Tom said, is pathological. Right? Uh, but the general phenomena is, is perfectly uh, common. And I'm not sure it's a terrible thing. Right? Again, going back to this idea of, of ours is not a pure, uh, democracy, ours is not a country in which democracy or the rule of law or, or, or government is reducible to the will of one single person. Right? That, that idea is, is, is fairly clearly antithetical to the design of the Constitution. The idea or the notion that uh, when we look to what the federal government is doing, yes, we, we care about whether the preferences of those who elected the president are being honored. Yes, that matters, clearly. But it also matters that the due forms of law and the due processes that Congress, in its lawful exercise of the necessary and proper power, which gives it the authority to structure the executive branch, which gives it the authority to require that agencies ensure certain things before issuing or withdrawing regulations, all of that is perfectly lawful, right? Mm -hmm. It seems to me just as important to our democracy that we have that element of the rule of law and, and, and good institutional functioning working as it does to have a president who is elected by a majority of the people exercising power on the basis of their preferences. And one of the difficulties or the either the difficulties or the geniuses of, of the American system is that, at least on, in the Article II side, we have both going on at the same time. We have both democratic accountability and we have government under the rule of law. And when you have both of those principles and they push against each other, and the, as in the cases that you asked about, and in this broader set of cases, yeah, there are going to be hard in cases. There are going to be instances that, that look questionable. But that's a natural outcome of the system that we have, and I'm not sure that's a terrible thing. Well, let's talk a little bit about elections, um, since how a democracy conducts its elections is so critical to the, the um, analysis of the health of democracy. Um, so, Tom, can you talk a little bit about the state of uh, elections in the United States? What are the pros, what are the cons, and are there any reforms that you would suggest in particular? You know, we have midterms coming up. Are there things that people should be keeping in mind as they head to the polls? Great. Yeah. So when the Economist Intelligence Unit downgraded the United States, they focused on the way we run or don't run elections in this country. Um, and um, um, this is not just you know, elites saying this. In surveys of Americans, when asked, how do you think the United States performs in terms of uh, neutral election management in terms of every uh, participation and people being allowed to vote. Most uh, Americans think we do badly. So it's a real concern that we all recognize. 
Part of the problem is constitutional. Madison, remember, was working before uh, political parties were a concept. And so in the draft, uh, in the Constitution, the power to regulate elections is assigned to state legislatures, which are, of course, partisan bodies now. And uh, so that's a kind of a design flaw. You can't blame Madison. Couldn't really have thought that they would be as partisan as they are. But of course, this is the source of many of the problems in election management. Uh, partisan gerrymandering in particular, occasional efforts to change the power of offices between the time uh, uh, one party loses and the other takes office. We've seen that in some American states recently. Um, and I should add secretaries of state, which when I was young uh, it was seen as kind of a technocratic nonpartisan office, sort of like electing the county coroner. It happens to be a partisan name on it, but it didn't mean anything. No longer true, and particularly in the cycle we're in, secretaries of state, who counts the vote? In at least two states uh, are people who are running for offices, the votes of which they shall count. Well, that just uh, uh, you know, obviously is a big design flaw in the Constitution. There are, I think, 14 American states where the voters, through constitutional amendment or the legislature, has agreed to delegate the power to uh, drawing boundaries, at least to technocratic commissions. And political scientists who study this tell us that the elections in those states are better run, more responsive to changes in public opinion. You see far less partisan distortion through the gerrymandering process, the boundary drawing process. So that strikes us as a solution that is arguably within reach. I mean, it's a little bit of the fox guarding the hen house, but that would be, if one reform, if I could uh, turn on overnight, I would have all the states go to such a system. In the absence of being able to amend the Constitution, um, there are still some things we could do. I, one of the things we talk about is getting secretaries of state and those who run elections to start to have more common standards uh, across the country. You know, there's not, not by law, but by norm and by management practice, we're facing, I think, this cycle, um, you know, real threats to the counting of ballots through foreign manipulation of the way votes are counted, the uh, local processes. If we had some common standards, some common, you know, maybe not common technology, but at least common security, uh, we would have better elections. We'd be done with the problem of hanging chads and so on. Uh, and so that's something I think is achievable even in the absence of major uh, constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Aziz, um, what are the challenges that you are particularly maybe concerned about with respect to the election? Uh, let me let me step back and put it in, in in the frame of the book, which is to which which is a frame of thinking about what we've seen around the world and how it might play out in the United States. And and one thing you see around the world is is a consistent set of tools, legal and constitutional tools, that are deployed as mechanisms and means to undermine the quality of democracy. And you see a conscious diffusion a borrowing of tools from one jurisdiction to another. Right? Here, here's an example, it's not quite a legal tool, but I think it's a nice example of the kinds of diffusion that we talk, talk about in the book. And it's the weaponization of social media spaces, in particular Twitter and Facebook, by uh, anti-democratic forces as a way of destabilizing democracy. As, as everyone in this room knows, this start, or, or the epicenter for this is the Putin regime in Russia, uh, it, it is, it is a, there are a set of web-based techniques that are first deployed with respect to Ukrainian elections uh, starting at the, the turn of the century. Um, uh, we start to see the same set of tools being deployed in Hungary, in Poland, uh, in uh, France uh, to aid the, the Front National, uh, and in the UK around the election or the referendum uh, uh, respecting departure from the United, European Union, right? Uh, the tools involve manipulating the attention that people give to different kinds of news in ways that polarize them, increase anger across the political aisle, uh, and uh, make uh, reasoned political debate harder, right? It, it, th this problem, right, which is diffusing around the world, it is one that our legal frameworks do not provide good tools for responding to, right? And, and, and why is that? Um, 
it's because when we think of the way that the marketplace of ideas, the public sphere, uh, is necessary for democracy, the framers conceptualized the problem as one of censorship. They thought, look, the way that the public sphere is corrupted is through the state coming in and blocking certain kinds of speech from being made. Therefore, they included the First Amendment, Congress shall enact no law, right, abridging the freedom of speech, um, in the Bill of Rights. But as technologies change, so the technology of polluting and corrupting the public sphere has changed. And the mechanisms that are pivotal today involve not censorship, but capturing the limited attention that we have as citizens, as users of web-based technologies, and exploiting the psychological weaknesses that drive our attention to one thing as opposed to another, right? The First Amendment might stand in the way of reasonable interventions that are designed to mitigate the pathological negative effects of these kinds of interventions, right? Uh, and, and although it's not at all clear that anyone, anywhere around the world, Germany is just trying to do this now, has a good solution for how to deal with the pollution of our public sphere. Mm -hmm. well, so we have a lot of great audience questions I want to get to, but I just want to ask one follow-up question on what you were just discussing, because I think it's so important. Um, this, I, this, this relationship between social media uh, uh, use online, polarization online, and democracy. And so, Tom, earlier I mentioned that last week we were in Pittsburgh for this First Amendment conference, and there was a lot of discussion on various panels about quote unquote fake news, I know people don't like that term, but how to solve the problem of polarized media and, and polarization in the US. And the consensus seemed to be absent any you know, constitutional reform, institutional reform, that it was really up to citizens as consumers of news and platforms to recognize what's going on and to kind of um, ensure that we sample media in, in a responsible way. Do you agree with that or are other um, solutions that you think are maybe more pressing? I would agree to it with that. I mean, we're fairly critical of certain aspects of the American constitutional design, but one of the things we are big proponents of, and it's not just because we're at the University of Chicago, but the free speech uh, rules in this country are in fact more robust than, than anywhere else. And we think that is, um, is actually a good thing. Um, you know, in the ideas that the society is gonna have to govern itself. When the government can police speech in the name of democracy, which is common in many European countries, it is likely to be abused. Hungary, um, under Orban's regime in 2013, amended the Constitution to say rights to freedom of expression must be exercised in ways that do not hurt the rights of the majority, uh, or Hungary's character as a Christian nation, I believe. So, you know, well, that's basically saying you don't really have freedom of speech. The government's going to come in. Um, the militant democracy idea, which goes back to the 1930s, is based on policing certain parties and certain kinds of speech, and generally speaking, hasn't prevented these European countries from seeing the rise of far-right anti-system parties in their politics. So this is one thing we think uh, the United States does well. I would like to see much more attention to programs of digital citizenship and things like this to teach young people like how you do consume the internet. We're never going to solve all the problems. And the big social media companies are starting to try to deal with it, but they're, they're, they're facing loss of market share. In fact, in the tragic Pittsburgh shooting, uh, there was a sort of a website uh, that, that the, the person was on, the shooter was, was on a lot of the time. I just looked it up last night. It's based right here in Philadelphia um, on Market Street, that company. And they're going to keep doing what they're going to do. Is that wrong? But, They've moved, I'm sorry, okay, so, they, so yeah. That, yeah. Um, but, the, but regardless, there's always that potential for you know, little subgroups to rise. Still, I think um, you know, self-policing by the big social media comp companies and demand from citizens that they do so, um, I think is the main strategy mm -hmm. that we're gonna have to pursue. So, um, Aziz, feel free to respond to anything Tom said, and then we have yeah, an audience. What do we do, questions? Oh, the audience question uh, just basically asks, how does and should the press serve as a check to, uh, to be a watchdog on government um, or in democracy? 
the press is a common early target of anti-democratic forces uh, uh, bent on eroding the quality of democracy. The press gets attacked uh, indirectly or directly. Uh, a nice example of an indirect attack is in Hungary, where uh, Hungarian regulators under Fidesz uh, drove out of business the company responsible for selling billboard space to the political opposition, with the result that literally the only face of a politician you see in Hungary is Viktor Orbán's, right? Uh, more directly, uh, the press is subject to either verbal or outright physical assaults uh, by either uh, people, associ individuals associated with the state, right? This is common in Russia, uh, or by those who are uh, uh, who are linked to the state but not actually part of the state, right? So the, the, and, and, and the reason for this is that democracy depends upon a shared set of facts, right? You cannot meaningfully talk about democratic choice unless you have some bare common foundation about what is happening in the world, right? And, and this is why, this is why, uh, in my view, uh, the efforts of uh, elected officials to cast doubt upon what most people, and I think most people on both sides of the political spectrum, at least until recently, would have recognized as simple facts about the world, is so dangerous, is so dangerous. Because it, it, is, it is a vehicle for uh, undermining trust in an institution, the press, that is a necessary part of our democracy. It is uh, a, a, a way, uh, and it, it is a way of doing so that, that, again, the First Amendment just does not speak to. So uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, we uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times arguing that there should be a remedy for uh, journalists or public figures who were libeled by the government. Right? It turns out that in the last few years, there have been a whole series of instances in which individual journalists have been threatened or uh, defamed by people in government. And there is no legal remedy for uh, what, if it had been done by a private citizen, would be subject to serious legal sanction. Right? So that, that's one example of a, of, of a remedy, but, but the deep problem of how you protect the press as a necessary element of democracy, but as an element of democracy that necessarily, or almost necessarily, can't be fully in the control of the state, right? right? That's a really hard problem, and one that our First Amendment just does not completely speak to and which I think will require a great deal of both public commitment, but also creative thinking. And we, we do a little bit of this in the book beyond the libel uh, idea uh, about uh, creating a sheltered space for the media as a production, as, as the source of our common facts upon which democracy depends. Um, Tom. This question asks, given the current lack of bipartisanship, to what degree do you see political parties as essential to our democracy? Well, political parties are in trouble all over the world um, as institutions. They're, they used to be sort of a central left-right cleavage in most democracies, and I think that's disappeared or disappearing for a lot of different reasons in terms of its economic content, in terms of its policy content. Uh, and so we are seeing around the world the rise of anti-system parties. Um, Parties have to be central. You can't really have democracy without parties that we know of. And we don't know of a, a way to, um, to aggregate opinion and, uh, in, in without them. So parties are going to be central. To me, it goes back to elections. Because of the way the lines are drawn, we have a system where voters don't choose the politicians. The politicians choose their voters. And that, of course, leads to more extreme members of each party getting elected. They don't have to compete for the votes in the center. And so if we could solve that problem I was talking about before, I think we'd get better parties and more responsive parties. But you know, parties are under attack 
are, they're, they're, they're under, um, they're eroding in some sense all over the world. And I'll just make a note about Brazil, where there was just the election yesterday. Brazil is a country with extremely weak political parties. The party which uh, Bolsonaro has uh, taken over and won with um, got something like 60,000 votes in the last presidential election in the whole country. It's just a vehicle for him. And um, the country basically runs without robust parties. Um, and I don't think it's going to be a very pretty time going forward for Brazil. Um, Aziz, this question asks, do you think we will ever be able to eliminate the Electoral College, and don't we need to do that? Or do we need to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, so the, the, the question is, is, asks about the feasibility of constitutional change. Uh, and con constitutional change, not just of the tinkering at the margins kind that we have seen since the, uh, roughly the middle of the 20th century, uh, but uh, deep and fundamental change of a sort that we really haven't seen since the Reconstruction Amendments, right? And, and even the Reconstruction Amendments were awfully difficult to pass. Indeed, there's a, a colorable but probably wrong argument uh, in the legal academy that the Reconstruction Amendments were unlawful because the southern states were forced at gunpoint into signing them, right? That's how difficult uh, structural reform is uh, to do in the United States. Um, there is now a movement, as I'm sure many of you know, to hold a new constitutional convention. Uh, there is more than 30 states that have um, uh, uh, made the, the appropriate moves under state law uh, to do that. Um, uh, and it's at least conceivable that you would have a constitutional convention in the near term. Now, I think we're skeptical about the prospects of such a constitutional convention. We don't think that the issues like the uh, geographic malapportionment of the Electoral College and the Senate that I think are, are important uh, 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 issues for our democracy, for anybody who cares about uh, a fair system of representation, right? I don't, I don't think that those are the issues that will get addressed in a constitutional convention of uncertain and inchoate form that we would see in any, in any plausible scenario in the next five to 10 years. And instead, what I would expect in a, a new constitutional convention is the kind of accelerated, even violent partisanship that characterized the last confirmation hearing. Uh, so I, I think if you, if you thought that the last confirmation hearing was dispiriting and, and uh, 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 terrible, and I think that people on both sides of the political aisle had that view, um, expect a new constitutional convention to be that on steroids. So the prospect that that would, would solve the Electoral College problem, I think is, is wildly implausible. Okay. Um, Tom, this question asks, what do you think, are, or are there prospects of the results of the Mueller investigation for improving the functioning of our democracy? Wow, that's a tough one. Do you have an answer to that? Well, I, I don't think that, 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 that Mueller will produce, I don't think first that Mueller is going to indict uh, the president. I, I think that it's possible that he indicts uh, uh, the president's son-in-law uh, or senior aides. I think that's, that's possible, but maybe unlikely. It, it also seems to me quite uncertain whether uh, Mueller will generate the kind of public report that uh, Ken Starr uh, produced at the end of the Whitewater investigation. Um, I think that there's a good case for the production of something like the, uh, the uh, it's called a roadmap document that was produced at the end of the, uh, of the investigation by Archibald Cox into the, into the Watergate break-in, which set forth a kind of basic outline of uh, what a prosecution of a group of individuals, including the president, might look like. Right? And I think that that kind of framework document would be useful whether or not Mueller found evidence that inculpated either the president or somebody who was close to him. I suspect that whatever happens next week, we're not going to see a uh, Congress that is bipartisan um, orientation likely to act upon, uh, upon such a document. 
But I do think that it is extraordinarily important for the American people, for the American voters, uh, particularly looking forward to the next electoral cycle, to have some kind of an accounting in a sense of what happened uh, or, 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 or what the, the results of a, of a seemingly uh, deep and comprehensive investigation of the kind that Mueller was engaged in. I think that that kind of information is really important. And, and, and I would focus much more upon the information and the way that it, I mean, surely it will be contested and spun and lied about, but nonetheless, it will, there will be, one hopes, some foundation for reasoned public judgment by sensible, good faith, people acting in good faith, right, for 2020. And I think that's the thing that's really important not, you know, is Mueller going to indict X or Y? I, just, I think that that's a sideshow. Okay. Um, Tom, I'll just ask you for some brief closing thoughts. Are you optimistic about the future of our constitutional democracy and of democracies around the world? And what should we be looking for in the coming years as, as yeah. the greatest challenges? Great. So I'm optimistic by nature. Um, I think being around, you know, really smart 20-somethings who are really engaged and passionate and, you know, really want to go do things, is, it, it helps with that. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I think we're in for a bit of a rough ride. And, um, and that's partly just maybe based on, you know, personal experience, talking with people across this, this, this divide and how it has all become so personal and uh, escalates so quickly. Um, we're polarizing very deeply. It's hard to know if we even have a polity in a fundamental sense um, some days. Um, but, uh, it, you know, in the end, I mean, maybe this is the line I'll conclude on, you know, we, we recognize that the institutions that we spend our lives studying are not sufficient to protect democracy from erosion, uh, but they may be necessary. That is, they can act as speed bumps, but not roadblocks when you have a process of erosion. And um, I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about a lot of institutions. Democracies are always messy and ugly, um, but our institutions are old and maybe they shall hold. At the end of the day, though, only democracy saves demo can save democracy, only voting and mobilization. Uh, and that's why um, it's, the, in the end, the most important thing. And protecting it institutionally is the most important thing. Aziz, last word to you. Are you optimistic? So I, I went canvassing this this weekend uh, in the suburbs of Chicago, and I, I went with my next door neighbor and her his uh, six year old uh, kid, and uh, she's this you know bright, uh, charming, very very blonde uh, little girl who would go to people's doors and be like. Have you registered? <laughs> and she, I, I expected her to last half an hour. Yeah. And she was out with us for three hours, knocking on doors. It did help that many people were like, here, have some candy. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at the students that we teach, and I look at my kids, and I look at uh, other people's kids, and I think there is a generation of people who have who are, uh, who, who I think can get this, who, who are situated and oriented to, to do a far better job than we have done. And my hopes are, are keyed to the existence of, the, of, of those later generations. And I think our job, and this is consistent with what Tom just said, is, is we, we've just got to do enough to keep things going until the next group of people comes along and does a much better job than we did. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming or in thanking Professor Aziz and Professor Thompson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.